Hey folks, welcome back. Time for a bit more Halloween RPG action. This time we're taking a break from Call of Cthulhu and taking a look at a different approach to Lovecraftian investigation, and that's Trail of Cthulhu by Kenneth Height and Pelgrain Press, as you can see down here. So this is based on the gumshoe system, so it's very different from the D100 based BRP system that underlies Call of Cthulhu, but there are other ways in which it's quite similar. It is still skill based, it's still based on investigation, and as you can see on the back actually, um, it's actually done in cooperation with Chaosium, so that they can use all of the same sources of Lovecraftian goodness Chaosium uses, because they go beyond Lovecraft, of course, and include things from uh, Howard and, and uh, Derleth and all these other contributors to the mythos over the years. But the real sort of unique selling point of this version of this approach to horror gaming is that the gumshoe rule system streamlines play in investigative games by basically making sure that if you have the appropriate skill and you declare that you're using it, you will find the clue in whatever situation you're in. So you don't have to roll for a spot hidden or all that kind of stuff like you do in Call of Cthulhu, you just get the clue. And the reason for that is that they, they base this idea on the concept that when you watch an investigative show, whether it's, you know, something like CSI or some, you know, classic like Dragnet or whatever, getting the clues is, is not the interesting part. It's actually fitting them together and solving the mystery that's the interesting part. And if you deny players the chance to get the clues, which can sometimes happen in Call of Cthulhu, then you're denying the players the chance to, you know, find all the pieces of the mystery and, and really put everything together. I think it's a, a valid point, and we'll get into it a little bit once we get into the introduction, but yeah, and alongside that, it's, it's also quite light as far as details go in combat and stuff like that. There is combat in this game, of course, and there are monsters, of course, and they cram quite a lot into about 240 pages or so of content. An admirable amount, actually. It's, it's, it's stuffed with things to do. And there are numerous great supplements for the game as well, including some really excellent campaigns and scenarios. It's just a, a different approach. So it, it, I hope that by viewing this video, comparing it to the Call of Cthulhu stuff that I've done, you can kind of decide for yourself which is the, the best way you want to go. I think they both have their strengths and weaknesses, and it really depends on what sort of hits home with your playgroup, I think. And given that neither game is too expensive to pick up, you know, the, the core rule book, even in PDF, if you need to save some money, I would say give them both a, a good look because, you know, there, there are some key differences that we'll see as we go through. And when we look at some of the scenarios, which are kind of intermixed with new and quite unique campaign setting ideas for Trail of Cthulhu, they, they do take a different means of plunging you into the Cthulhu mythos. They, they use very unique settings, very unique ideas to drive those settings, and they try to make them very atmospheric, very detailed. And not that Call of Cthulhu doesn't do that, but Call of Cthulhu also has a lot of openness. You know, they're setting books that are just, you know, here's what happens and how you play in the 1860s in Down Dark Trails, for example. Whereas here, the Dreamland supplement is of a totally different character. It's set in a certain time and place with particular people. It's more specific, but that also gives them license to really sort of dive deep. So again, it's, it's a matter of taste, really. So without further ado, let's crack it open and take a quick look through. You see, first of all, we have these two symbols here, which you'll see throughout the book, actually. The symbol on the left represents purist. So if you're a Lovecraftian purist, you want your characters to have a more difficult time, especially like you see in the later Lovecraft stories, then you go into purist play mode. Whereas if you want to be a bit more pulpy, you want to be you know, double fisting guns and stuff like that, then you may want to go for the pulp mode, which is represented by this. So throughout, there are little sidebars and additional info that are oriented towards one player style over the other. As you can see, so the gumshoe system was developed by Robin D. Laws, but this game itself was written by Kenneth Height. He's done a lot of amazing writing for this game line. So one of the great things about it is even if you don't like the system, it's well worth, in my opinion, at least picking up some of the supplements, and in particular the campaign settings and such like, which can really be inspiring when it comes to how you present the Cthulhu Mythos even in a different system. So as we break into the TOC here, we can see, I mean, it's absolutely packed with stuff. There's introduction, which basically explains why do this game when we already have Call of Cthulhu, which is a valid question that a lot of people will have. Then we go through the, the means of creating an investigator, the different kinds of abilities, how you buy them, investigative abilities, general abilities, the stability mechanic, which is kind of sanity mechanic, gathering clues, which is of course a key part of the gumshoe system. Then we go through details of the Cthulhu mythos. And one thing that they do as well in Trail of Cthulhu, and you'll see this in a later video I'll do on the Hideous Creatures supplement, which is the kind of gigantic bestiary for the game. They allow for different interpretations of what 
Lovecraftian creatures actually are and what they do. They give you suggestions to base kind of entire adventures around these creatures. And the gods themselves are not really statted out. I mean, in, in the, the Malleus Monstrorum that we looked at, for Cthulhu, you know, the gods have stats. They can't really be killed. They'll come back. But in Trail of Cthulhu, at least in the core book, if, you know, Azathoth or Cthulhu shows up, then, you know, it, it's basically over for you. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's a valid approach too. But, you know, if you're playing a pulpier game, you may want to to think about that, whether that fits with you. The game is also set in the 30s. So we're looking at a decade of, you know, the Great Depression, lots of poverty, famine, the beginning of war, etc. So a little bit further forward in time than Call of Cthulhu's default setting of the 1920s. And then we get into GM advice. So, you know, putting this all together, some tips for players, tips for keepers, and then they give you some different campaign frames which some of which are expanded in further supplements like Book Hounds of London. And then they give you an introductory adventure, which is actually quite complicated. And one thing I should say as well is that this is the first edition of the book. It's been out since 2008, and it's still a great game, but the gumshoe system itself has evolved in a number of different directions since the release of Trail of Cthulhu. We have things like Knight's Black Agents, which adds a ton of additional like special maneuvers called cherries that you can do if you have a high skill in a certain area. There's a lot more combat and action in that game. We have, you know, Fear Itself, which got a second edition. We have Mutant City Blues, Time Watch, and most recently, uh, The Sword and the Serpentine, which has been very highly praised for its approach to sort of a high-action sword and sorcery fantasy adventure setting. So Gumshoe can do a lot, and I think the second edition is planned to kickstart in November. That's a very recent announcement. Apparently, they don't plan to change much of the core of the system, but I think they will be adding in some of these aspects of how the system has developed since the original release. Because if you go on the the website for Pelgrane Press, I'll put a link in the description for this, the main category page for Trail of Cthulhu includes a lot of great downloads, one of which is a free one called The Enchiridion of Elucidation, which is not very easy to pronounce. (laughs) But download that for sure, because within that, you'll see lots of little cool suggestions and house rules including things like how to incorporate aspects of Knight's Black Agents into the game, some extra tips for keepers on how to to use clues and investigative point spends correctly. It's a really great little 40-page addition to the the core book that I think will help new players a lot. The book itself, I think, still reads fine, but it is such a different way of approaching this style of game compared to Call of Cthulhu. It does take some getting used to, and that book will help you to think about, you know, if my, if my players enjoy more crunch in combat, there's there's bits in there for you. You know, if you want to handle magic differently, there's bits in there for you. There's lo- lots of great possible additions to, to tailor the game to your preferences. So definitely, I would pick that up as well. Then finally, we have the appendices. So, you know, BRP and gumshoe, how you can do gumshoe style play using the BRP rules and converting BRP content to Gumshoe. These are all very useful things. Then we have sources and resources for Lovecrafty and stuff, useful documents including the character sheet, Keeper's Investigative Matrix, Investigative Ability Checklists, and so forth. And then we have the indexes of alien races, beasts, gods, spells, etc. So, without further ado, we'll get into the introduction. And I think it's really worth reading this section here about why the game exists. And they, they make a nice sort of analogy, right? So, Shakespeare wrote the great classic play King Lear, right? And say here that Call of Cthulhu is the greatest RPG of all time. So, why would you want to adapt that to a new engine, a new period, a new approach? They explain it as kind of like King Lear being adapted by Akira Kurosawa into the classic movie Ran in samurai-era Japan. And transferring the story to Japan makes the themes actually clearer for some people than in the original play. Did Ran improve on the play? Not really. It was just a different way to highlight some of the key features of the original play and set them in a different aspect that highlighted actually the original strength of that first bit of writing. And, and that's what they're trying to do here, essentially. So they say, we believe the strength of Call of Cthulhu is that, you know, you deliberately make characters increasingly vulnerable to the threats they face. They're just normal people. They do have to be brave and face the loss of sanity, the loss of stability, the loss of their possible friends, families, loved ones, companions. And the further they dive into the unknown, into the unnatural, the harder things get for them. And and that, you know, is still in this game. You know, they didn't want to lose that feel. But what they did want to do is 
you know, create a laser focus on investigative mechanics that they felt would help highlight the strengths of Cthulian storytelling. So that's the basic justification for why they've done this. And the fact that, you know, they collaborated with Chaosium and, and, you know, they, they built a relationship with them to make sure they could use the same base material, I think is great. You know, you can swap back and forth between the two as well because they've given you the tables to do so in the appendices in the back. So they also have a nice little box here of core concepts so they assume you know what an rpg is the keeper is the game master the investigators are the pcs the player characters the investigative abilities are abilities that always work so if if you use it there's a clue that's relevant to that ability you will get it general abilities which are you know your your combat abilities and stats you can fail those and you will use point spends to try and do better on those but more on that later stability is a short-term measure of your investigator's mental health and it goes down during an adventure but refreshes afterwards, where a sanity is like the long-term measure of the exposure to the mythos. It goes down slowly, and it's very hard to get it back up again. And then they talk about, you know, basic definitions of the mythos and Lovecraft, etc. The other nice thing about the game is that right in the core rules, you have this, as I said, the division between pulp and purist. That's highlighted throughout the game, and they give you lots of sidebars, you know, so if you're a GM trying to create a pulp campaign... You know, these are the kind of point spends you would allow during character creation, etc. You can see here, we go right into character creation at the start, which I think is a great way to begin. They have a quick reference here. So ask your keeper how the campaign frame that they want to set up affects character creation. So, you know, if they want to set caps on certain abilities or on the build points available based on the number of players or the style of the game. Ask them first, then you choose an occupation from the list here. The ones that are particularly great for purist games are marked with the purist symbol, as you can see here. And those are the types of characters that we see in Lovecraft stories, basically. Then, based on your conception of your investigator's character and backstory, choose your drive, so that what's their reason for going out and doing all this crazy stuff, and then spend build points as it's told by your GM on your abilities and trying to make sure that your party as a whole has as many abilities covered as possible, especially investigative abilities, so that, you know, if you're, you're all stumbling into an abandoned crypt or a spooky house or whatever, you have the highest chance of gathering as many clues as you can basically, because you'll have all the, the spread of investigative abilities covered. Then define the pillars of your sanity and sources of your stability if your campaign uses them. Choose any contacts you have, and then decide on your investigator's name, birthplace, favorite cigarettes, religious belief, or anything else that you think will help you understand and roleplay your investigator. Those are kind of the last touches. So as far as occupations, they do a nice little explanation of each one. So we have the alienist, who is a specialist in mental illness, could be a Vienna trained psychoanalyst or a neurologist or a medical doctor with interest in behavioral science. They have certain uh, occupational abilities, so biology, languages, German and Latin, library use, medicine, pharmacy, and psychoanalysis, assess honesty, and any other two pers interpersonal abilities. They start with a credit rating of three to four, and they have a special ability, so by using medicine or inter interpersonal ability, you have access to mental re records and sanitarium wards generally off limits to the public. If you're a licensed MD with a medicine rating of two or more, you can do the same for medical records and hospital wards. You can make psychoanalysis tests for psychological triage at a difficulty of three instead of four, and it costs you only one psychoanalysis point instead of two to stabilize an erratic character. You can recover your own stability, but you can only recover one point for each psychoanalysis point you spent. And then here we have some pulp rules as well. So for example, you may build points into and use the hypnosis ability. So here they've classified that as more of a, a pulp ability. Similarly to Call of Cthulhu, where it's kind of not on the main character sheet, but it can be available at the GM's option, and it is really useful. Then we have the antiquarian. So you value the past and willing, willingly immerse yourself in it. You don't necessarily have a great income, or you may be a resident scholar at a museum or a gallery, or you may deal in antiques or books or something like that. Your occupational abilities will include things like architecture, art history, bargain, history, languages, law, and library use, and then any one investigative ability as a personal specialty. The credit rating is more widespread between two and five than the alienist, being that you could be, you know, working in a lowly job at a antique shop, or you could be, you know, a curator at a gallery or museum. So there's quite a wide array of incomes that could come from that. So they have a special ability. Once per adventure, you may have an informative or suitable item for the current investigation back at the shop. Antiquarian book dealers may have a relevant volume of lore. Dealers in silver may have ornamental daggers. Importers may have a queer tribal mask from the Congo. To remember and uncover such an item requires a use of the corresponding ability, e.g. art history or library use. This item may either contain a core clue for solving the mystery, or it may provide a weapon or technique for resolving it. So that's a really useful ability, just to make it clear that you shouldn't be able to grab like powerful mythos artifacts and stuff using this ability necessarily, but you can use it to get clues and useful stuff. Then we have the archaeologist, so the Indiana Jones type. You might be a meticulous scholar, or you may be basically a tomb robber, <laughs> you know, 
bringing your bullwhip and pistol and fighting off other scavengers to get trophies from Tut's tomb or what have you. There are occupational abilities or archaeology, athletics, evidence collection, first aid, history, languages, library use, writing, and any other two investigative abilities. They have a higher credit rating of four to five. And their special is by using archaeology or a suitable interpersonal ability, you can get access to museum storage areas or be allowed to handle artifacts. You will likely not be able to carry them away with you legally regardless. If you have academic credentials, both archaeology rating of 2 plus and a credit rating of 3 plus, you can get access to closed stacks at a university library. So perhaps, you know, the restricted collection at Miskatonic University, for example. There's a note here as well about occupation and gender. So in the 30s, about a quarter of American women held jobs outside the home. During the Depression, 26 of 48 states passed laws against the employment of married women, but that had no real effect. So in 1940, the proportion of working women had slightly increased. So basically, the default option is that you, if you can suspend your disbelief sufficiently to imagine giant potential monstrosities, then a female doctor should be a more no problem. While a purist game would indeed be comfortably all-male, the popular culture of the era celebrated exciting adventurous women, both fictional and factual. So they're trying to encourage you to open your mind and allow female investigators to take whatever roles they would like. Then we have the artist, which is a nice purist career as well, alongside the antiquarian. So you could be a painter, a sculptor, a musician, or whatever. You're sensitive and temperamental. Your occupational abilities could be things like uh, architecture, art, art history, craft, disguise, flattery, photography, assess honesty, and any two academic or interpersonal abilities as personal specialties. And your credit rating will be anywhere between one to four. So you could be a starving artist with just one credit rating, or you might be quite successful with, with four. And your special ability can be you may refresh one pool point in an ability representing your chosen art form during any significant downtime in an adventure up to a maximum of four times per session. This represents time spent rehearsing, sketching, or what have you. Then we have another purist profession in the author. So you use words to capture existence, to conceal yourself, to reveal the truth, or to sell fantasy to depression-stricken readers, perhaps all of the above. Your labors are solitary and your rewards sporadic. You may have too much time to think. So your occupational abilities would be art, history, languages, library use, oral history, assess honesty, and three other abilities as personal specialties or left over from previous jobs. Credit rating is generally low between one to three which is not surprising and as a special ability you may use any downtime in an adventure to refresh one academic pool point up to a maximum of four times per session this represents time spent reading checking notes and files and so forth so similar to the special ability we see for the artist now we have the clergy so these are you know itinerant revival preachers neighborhood priests rabbi eager missionaries all kinds of members of different religions who are forming some sort of clerical role their occupational abilities include history languages which could be things like latin greek aramaic or hebrew library use psychoanalysis assist honesty reassurance theology and one other interpersonal ability and the credit rating again is quite variable between two and five and their special is that by using theology or reassurance, you can gain access to church records not generally or easily available to the public. Mere clerical status does not guarantee you access to the Z collection in the Vatican Library or similarly secret archives, of course, although a sufficiently grandiose spend and a kindly keeper might make such a thing possible. Okay. In a purist game, psychoanalysis is not one of your occupational abilities. But in pulp games, you can make psychoanalysis tests for psychological triage at a difficulty of three instead of four. Or you can bless holy water, save the souls of the dying with extreme unction, use crucifixes to fend off vampires, and even exercise demons in a contest of stability against the demon's health. So this benefit is dependent on the campaign frame, of course. Then we have the criminals living on the wrong side of the law in a secret world of degeneracy. So their occupational abilities would include things like bargain, intimidation, locksmith, scuffling, which is basically brawling, if we were talking Call of Cthulhu terminology, sense trouble which means you know your spidey sense is tingling shadowing which is following somebody stealth streetwise and one other interpersonal or technical ability is a personal specialty credit rating can be anywhere from zero to four so they might be just living on the streets scraping by and surviving or they could be quite wealthy if they're good at their criminality or higher up in an organization like the mafia or whatever so for a special criminals with point pools and conceal filch or shadowing may spend points after rolling the die for a test. For every two points you spend after rolling the die, you increase the die result by one. This only applies if you are undistracted, not directly observed. It never applies during a contest. So that's a very rare occasion where you can decide whether to spend points until after you roll the d6. Every roll in this game is a d6 plus a modifier, essentially. So that makes it very easy to understand what you need to do, but it's often a hard decision to know in the moment how many of your pool points for an ability you should spend, because those pool points for each ability, they indicate your general skill level, but when you spend them, they don't refresh right away. You need to have a rest, or you need to... Some of them don't even come back until, you know, the next adventure, let alone the following session. So you really have to be careful with your point spends and use them effectively. So having a special ability like this, where you can add your pool points potentially after the roll, you say, oops, 
so I missed it by one. So I'll spend two points to make sure I pass this test. That could be extremely useful. Also, members of the Mafia may take one free rating point in languages to know Italian. Members of similar criminal organizations may have similar ratings. So, you know, the Irish Mafia, the Russian Mafia, etc. Then we have the Dilettante, which is another good purist career. So you're basically a, a trust fund kid, essentially, and you kind of do whatever you want. Your occupational abilities are credit rating, <laughs> flattery, writing, and any five abilities you choose. So you have all this freedom and spare time. Your credit rating is 3+, plus, so you're generally pretty good on having money to hand. And your, for your special, you may use your credit rating pool to call on personal connections in any field of endeavor. These contacts will generally be relatives, old school fellows, and similar people of your social class. You've got the doctor, another classic purist career. You see your work as emblematic of the best in society, rational, humane, clean, and selfless. The wealthier and more successful doctors can avoid the blood and filth that their noble aims are built upon. So the occupation abilities would be accounting, biology, first aid, forensics, languages, Latin, medicine, pharmacy, assess honesty, and reassurance. They have a high credit rating of four to six. Doctors still made a lot of money back then. And for specials, it, by using medicine or reassurance, you have access to medical records and hospital wards generally off limits to the public. If you're affiliated with a hospital, sanitarium, or other facility, you can automatically use reassurance to talk your way into any part of your institution from the drugs locker to the deep freeze. When you use first aid, each point spent yields three health points rather than two. You gain two health points rather than one for each first aid point you spend to heal yourself. You can stabilize the condition of a seriously wounded victim by spending only one first aid point rather than two. So, very useful. You can also be a hobo. <laughs> so, you're a king of the road. You ride the rails to avoid society, looking for handouts and working only when necessary. You may be a thief on occasion, but not professionally. Your occupational abilities as a hobo would be athletics, bargaining, filch, outdoorsman, sense trouble, stealth, and streetwise. The credit rating is zero unless the keeper allows you to permanently change your occupation. For example, if you get married or drafted, and you can never put any points to credit ratings. You're always at zero. But they have a special. So in addition to their normal functions, you can use Sense Trouble or Streetwise to read hobo signs and find out the lay of the land in a strange town. You can use Streetwise to activate fellow hobo contacts. Other contacts available to you might include communists, such as itinerant international workers of the world labor organizers, friendly railroad guards, charity workers, or a local lady known to be a soft touch. Then another purist occupation, we have the journalist. So you piece together the patterns of life and build them into a story, revealing the truth about the world around you. Your occupational abilities will include cop talk, so your ability to talk shop with the police, disguise, evidence collection, languages for foreign correspondence, oral history, photography, assess honesty, reassurance, shadowing, and one other interpersonal ability. They're reasonably well paid, between two and four on the credit rating. And for specials, they can use reassurance to have access to newspaper morgues. And at your own paper, you can do the same to get the records clerks to fetch relevant articles. Similarly, fellow journalists may confide off-the-record rumors and stories to you unless you're a direct competitor. Then we've got the military, better suited for a pulp campaign, perhaps. So you place yourself between others in danger for a paycheck, for your flag, for your mates, or because you have no other good options. Your occupational abilities include things like athletics, firearms, intimidation, outdoorsmen, scuffling, which is, again, brawling, or weapons. For army and marines, you could add conceal, driving, and stealth. For a corpsman or a medic, add first aid, medicine, reassurance. For engineers and heavy weapons, you would add driving, explosives, and mechanical repair. For navy, add astronomy, mechanical repair, and piloting. For officers of any branch, add bureaucracy, riding, or piloting, and reassurance. The credit rating will be 2 to four, 5 for officers and 2 to 4 for enlisted. For their special, you can spend 2 points from your reassurance pool to steady panicking or erratic characters, as long as your own stability is above zero. So the kind of the discipline and the routine drills the military puts you through has given you, you know, you can be the rock for the group and help people to, to keep their shit together. If you're still serving, you can use any interpersonal ability to gain entry to a military facility of your nation, except for explicitly top secret bases. Unnoticed entry may require other plans, however. If you're a combat veteran, the difficulty numbers, including opponents' hit thresholds, of your combat abilities, both athletics, firearms, scuffling, and weapons, do not increase by 1 until either your stability or your health drops below minus 5. If you're a combat veteran, your stability is capped at 10, but some threats to your stability may be made at a lower difficulty number. Then we have the nurse, a trained medical assistant, less comprehensively trained, less well paid, but also less callous than the typical doctor. Their occupational abilities will include biology, first aid, medicine, pharmacy, assess honesty, and reassurance. At keeper's discretion, a nurse who has to deal with hospital paperwork might have bureaucracy. One who has to deal with arrogant doctors might have flattery. Of course, they get paid much less than doctors with a credit rating of two to four. But for their specials, by using medicine or reassurance, you have access to medical records and hospital wards generally off limits to the public. And like a doctor, you can, if you're affiliated with a hospital or other facility, you can re use reassurance automatically to get anywhere in that facility. And again, similar to a doctor, you get three health points for use of first aid rather than two, and you gain two health points for yourself rather than one. 
and you can stabilize seriously wounded victims by spending one first aid point rather than two. Then we have a nice little sidebar here on professional parapsychology, which was a real thing back in back in those days and it's presented here as a possible career as well so academics hold you in dubious regard while true believers doubt your sincerity you straddle the line between reason and superstition between faith and proof you believe that the supernatural is not merely the natural we have not yet studied or perhaps that the methods of science can uncover or confirm the truths of theology so your occupational abilities could include anthropology electrical repair library use mechanical repair occult Photography, assist honesty, and sense trouble. You're not that well paid, generally. A two to three credit rating. For a pulp game, you could have a special where, like the Alienist, you can use the hypnosis ability. In an extremely pulpy game, you may actually have actual psychic powers or work closely with those who have them. For rules and descriptions of some psychic abilities in the gumshoe system, see the game Fear Itself, which I don't have, so we won't do that. You can also be a pilot is quite obvious your occupational abilities will be astronomy driving electrical repair mechanical repair piloting of course and sense trouble your credit rating will be two to three your special is you own or have regular access to an airplane its size and quality depend on your credit rating pool that's actually pretty amazing to have your access to an, your own airplane that can make a big difference and save a lot of time during investigations of course for a purist we have the police detective so you live by the code of the cop you draw lines between cops perps and civilians and it's best when nothing crosses them your occupational abilities include athletics cop talk of course driving evidence collection, firearms, interrogation, law, assess honesty, and sense trouble. Credit rating is 3 to 4, so you're not too badly paid. For your special with judicious use of cop talk, you can not only put the police at ease, but gain access to case files, evidence rooms, and prisoners, among other things not accessible by, no by normal civilians. If you're far outside your jurisdiction, you may need cop talk and a really good plan. Within your own jurisdiction, any points at all in cop talk will get you access to and use of police laboratories for forensics and ballistic tests or for more abstruse purposes, and even the morgue itself. Then we have the PI. Now, this is a classic occupation in Call of Cthulhu. Um, it's not marked as purist here, but I, I kind of put it pretty close to police detective in that category. Occupational abilities here are accounting, disguise, driving, law, locksmith, photography, assist honesty, reassurance, scuffling, and shadowing. So you get a bit more down and dirty than cops do. Credit rating is not as high as the cops, unfortunately, because you've got to work on contracts from uh, civilians who need you. For specials, privatized with point spends in disguise or shadowing may spend points after rolling the die for a test. For every two points you spend after rolling the die, you increase the die result by one. So again, you, you can decide to add points after you've rolled your die. It's at double the cost, but that can be extremely useful at times. For a pulpy occupational ability, a hard-boiled PI in the Chandler Hammett vein give them a different occupational abilities list which includes cop talk driving intimidation locksmith assist honesty scuffling shadowing and streetwise and then of course professor is a great purist occupation one we see frequently in lovecraftian literature so occupational abilities there would include bureaucracy dealing with academia it tends to give you experience in that i can speak from experience languages library use anyone interpersonal ability and any three academic abilities including for these purposes astronomy and chemistry your credit rating is pretty good three to five and as long as your academic credentials are intact and a credit rating of three plus using bureaucracy lets you enjoy nearly unrestricted access to closed library stacks research laboratories and even many private and government archives if you have a credit rating of five or better, you have tenure and cannot be removed from your professorship without clear public evidence of moral turpitude on your part. Finally, you can be a scientist. So you seek to advance science, perhaps to improve the world. Your occupational abilities could be electrical repair, evidence collection, languages, library use, photography, and any two of the following, astronomy, biology, chemistry, cryptography, forensics, geology, or physics. Credit rating here is three to five, similar to a professor. And your special abilities, you have access to a laboratory suitable for your research and can use credit rating to get tests and experiments performed in other laboratories by your peers or colleagues or get specialized equipment or machinery built. If you have academic credentials, credit rating of three or better, and a rating of two or more in astronomy, biology, chemistry, geology, or physics, you can get access to closed stacks at the university library. Now we get into drives. So there's a list of, of basic drives here. So this is what motivates the investigator. So the, the basic idea is that every investigator has a drive, a core desire that impels them to seek these strange truths lying beneath the surface of reality. It's more important to you than your life or sanity. It's something that really pushes you to the edge and beyond. And therefore, if you don't follow your drive in play, you actually suffer a cost to your stability. It can also potentially lead you into trouble that leads to the loss of stability anyway. Now, the basic list of drives is, is up here. Adventure is, is considered pulp. For the purists, we've got antiquarianism, artistic sensitivity, in the blood, and then we've got some unmarked ones like arrogance, bad luck, curiosity, ennui, follower, scholarship, 
and thirst for knowledge, which could fit in either category. And then we also have duty, revenge, and sudden shock for pulp as well. So they give a description of these kind of drives, you know, what it feels like to have that drive. So for an adventurer, for, for example, if you love the promise of action, combat, and strange new experiences, you're an adrenaline junkie. it would be particularly appropriate for a criminal, military, parapsychologist, or pilot. An example would be Harry Houdini and Under the Pyramids. If your drive is antiquarianism, then that would be obviously particularly appropriate for an antiquarian, an archaeologist, a clergy, or professor. And an example here would be Charles Dexter Ward from the Lovecraft stories, or Elihu Whipple in the Shunned House and the narrator of He. Arrogance. Basically, you, your drive is to prove everybody else wrong. So that's appropriate, especially for alienists and scientists. And that could be like Herbert West, the reanimator, or Crawford Tillinghast in From Beyond. If it's artistic sensibility, so you're already aware of the supernatural quality of the world, and that kind of drives your muse. So that'd be useful for artists, authors, or dilettantes. And of course, there's examples from Lovecraft as well, like uh, Richard Pickman and Pickman's model, the sculptor Wilcox in The Call of Cthulhu, etc. And The Dreams in the Witch House also fits this pattern, but sort of fits higher mathematics into the art category. Bad luck. So these things just seem to sort of happen to you. <laughs> More of a passive drive. It's kind of like being cursed. So it's especially appropriate for criminals and hobos. In a less cosmic game, i.e. a pulpy game, bad luck can be earned. So you may end up with this drive through things that happen to you. Curiosity, you just can't resist solving a mystery. So that'd be useful for journalists, for psychologists, police detectives, private investigators, scientists, and examples could include Randolph Carter in Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, and the narrators of Beyond the Wall of Sleep, The Lurking Fear, Color Out of Space, and The Shadow Over Innsmouth. If it's duty, you, you know that this what you're doing is dangerous and probably ill-advised, but somebody's got to go down and take care of the cult or the bad guy or whatever's going on. And if you don't do it, who will? You know, you feel it, a call to duty to do this. So that's particularly appropriate for clergy, doctors, military, and police detectives. They feel it's a part of their duty to the public or to their congregation or to their commanders. If you're a military person, perhaps, to take care of the danger. You know, that's your, your drive. And you'll put your own well-being and health behind you in order to follow that duty. As far as ennui, so perhaps you had one experience that you'll never get again. Or perhaps you've just read about such things in decadent yellowback novels. Tried everything else and nothing else matters. So you're just looking for something different, basically. And that could be workable for a bored military man, a starving artist, or maybe a bored dilettante who's just got too much time on their hands. Followers, so this is someone else has kind of brought you into a, a campaign. So if you were doing a, an ongoing campaign, you should pick a fellow investigator to be the person you follow. When or if they die... You can switch to a different leader or switch drives to revenge, which is pretty cool. That's particularly appropriate for doctors, military, and police detective who are used to having to take orders from others, depending on the situation. And again, we have some examples from the literature. Now, if it's in the blood, it kind of seems to be a natural drive to you. You're not sure why you keep coming back to the graveyard or looking over these creepy old books, but your others in your family kind of do the same thing, and it just... You know, you don't understand it. Other people don't understand it, but that's just how it is. Appropriate for the antiquarian or the bored dilettante. The narrator in uh, The Rats in the Walls and The Festival would be appropriate kind of example of this. Then we have The Drive for Revenge, which as we noted, could be, you know, if you are a follower and the person you follow was taken out, you might change it to revenge. So this is particularly appropriate for a criminal or private investigator. And again, we have an example of Ezra Whedon and Charles Dexter Ward and the narrator of The Lurking Fear after the death of his friend Monroe. Somebody close to you dies or is seriously injured that may be a reason for you to keep pressing on into the unnatural. Scholarship, so that would obviously be appropriate for the academic types, professors, scientists, and archaeologists. So Professor Engel and his nephew Francis Thurston in The Call of Cthulhu, Professor Dyer and his party in At the Mountains of Madness are perfect examples of that. Sudden shock is a good one, so this is when basically you were living a normal life and then something horrible happened. So the example is your long-dead great-grandfather holding cannibal feasts in your basement, the things you saw in the Innsmouth raid, or just a chance encounter with the outside... You might as well go further in because you aren't going back anytime soon. So you've had an encounter with the mythos and now you just see no other option but to go further and deeper because you can't return to being normal life anymore. And that's definitely appropriate for parapsychologists, but it could be for any, as they note here. And yeah, again, Rats in the Walls is a good example of that one. Thirst for knowledge. So you want to learn the secret lore of the cosmos. It's the quest for truth. You don't want to advance human knowledge. Only you truly burn to possess such secrets. And only you are willing to do what it takes to get them. Again, appropriate for a parapsychologist, archaeologist, or professor type. So then once you picked your occupation, your drive, then you start buying abilities for your investigator. So typically, investigators will have a variable pool of points to buy investigative abilities, depending on the group size, and 65 points to purchase general abilities. So investigative abilities, remember, are the ones that are always successful. 
So you want to talk with your group and make sure that between you, you all have complete coverage of all the skills, maybe even a little bit of overlap if there's some particularly important ones. So for occupational abilities, you get two rating points and occupational abilities for every one build points you spend. For example, 12 rating points of occupational abilities cost you six build points. Leftover half points are lost, so assign an even number of points to occupational abilities. You cannot select fleeing credit rating, Cthulhu Milos, health, sanity, or stability as occupational abilities. And they give you a little table here. So basically, the more players you have, the less investigative build points you should give to players on top of the 65 points for general stuff. That just makes it so that, you know, every character has their niche that they fill and that everybody has uh, investigative abilities that will come to play. Um, you'll need everybody at some point. And then they have a nice list of all the possible skills split up by families. So the investigative abilities comprise academic, interpersonal, and technical abilities. So we have accounting, anthropology, ar archaeology, architecture, art history, biology, Cthulhu mythos, cryptography, geology, history, languages, law, library, use, medicine, occult, physics, and theology. Under academic, under interpersonal, we have assess honesty, bargain, bureaucracy, cop talk, credit rating, flattery, interrogation, intimidation, oral history, reassurance, and streetwise. And under technical, we have art, astronomy, chemistry, craft, evidence collection, forensics, locksmith, outdoorsman, pharmacy, and photography. And then you have your general abilities. So these are the things where they're not automatically successful and you have to do tests, sometimes opposed tests. And that's things like athletic, disguise, conceal, electrical repair, health, firearms, first aid, sense trouble, scuffling, things that you'll use in combat and where there's a chance of failure or where you know you might encounter somebody who's way better off at this than you. Every ability has a numerical rating and some rating points and some abilities are free. So you start with a free rating of four points in sanity and one point in each of stability and health, but you can buy more of those with your general abilities points. They also give you a sidebar here. If you want to make an even more dangerous game, uh, then you can actually reduce the build points even further so that every investigator in the team is highly specialized. But that's, I would probably save that for, you know, a second or third campaign, not start off with that because it'd be a little bit tough for, for new players. Then uh, you may trade your free credit rating points in for other investigative build points on a one-to-one -one basis if your character concept calls for an especially unsuccessful or shunned investigator. And here they make a note, basically, for both mechanical and narrative reasons, make sure your investigator party covers as many ability bases as possible. Ideally, one investigator will have any needed skill and everyone has something cool that they do better than the rest of the group. When creating investigators, go down the ability list to make sure you've got a good spread of talents and that every investigator has a potential starring role at some point in the story. And that's really, really great advice. And it works for Cthulhu as well. I mean, you know, you need to have somebody who's really good at library use and certain weird languages and, and stuff like that. And then you need to have somebody who can fire a gun really well to protect you. Somebody who can brawl, you know, you need those kind of abilities too. But they really make that explicit here. You can also allow players to swap points between each other, but that's an optional rule. And then we get into rating points in, in credit rating, which cause one bill point each up to the top of the band listed under the occupation, after which they cost two bill points each, except for dilettantes who have no top limit on their credit rating band. And then in the purest mode, health and stability are capped at 12, so you can never have health and stability above that number. Your sanity is capped at 10 and can never be higher than 10 minus your Cthulhu Mythos rating. So that, again, is very similar to Call of Cthulhu. The more you dive into the Mythos, the lower your maximum sanity becomes. So there's kind of a death spiral there as you get more knowledgeable. And there's some tips on how many points you should buy with some examples of, you know, good wanting to have a good scuffling rating for an investigator. There's sort of discussion of ratings and skill. The rules don't care about the source of your skill. Skill. Basically, they try to point out that even a single rating point in an investigative ability indicates a high degree of professional accomplishment or impressive natural talent. So we're assuming that if you have even one point in an investigative ability, you're, you're pretty good at that. That's why you always get the clue. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't bother having it on the character sheet, you know. And here we have again further detail of our sample investigator, which is really helpful to show you how the, the buying of points works. When you buy rating points in an investigative ability, you go, they go into a pool of points to spend in situations related to its base ability. So you can ask to spend spend points to gain special benefits. So sometimes the keeper will offer you the chance to do that. In other circumstances, she may say, well, suggest to me what kind of special benefits the points will give you for the investigation. But spent investigative points don't return until the next scenario. So be careful about that. General abilities are different, though. They're handled in a different way because they have different narrative functions, basically. So in the same sort of way, you know, you will be spending points and stuff, but the way it works is different, which we'll get to in a minute. So here we have, you know, a nice detailed examples for all the investigative abilities, things that you might use them for in the context of an adventure, like describing the customs of ancient or historical cultures, if you're using archaeology, academic, if you're using architecture, judge the relative strength of building materials, 
you know, they give you some great examples of how you might use these. And of course, you can always discuss with the keeper if you think you could use one of your investigative abilities in an unusual way. But ultimately, it'll be up to them to adjudicate whether that makes any sense. The game gives you narrative power through these abilities that always work, but there have to have to be limitations on their use. Otherwise, it's just uh, the mystery becomes too straightforward. Also, whenever you use bureaucracy, cop talk, credit rating, streetwise, or any other ability to call on a professional contact or personal connection, you must supply the keeper with their name, residence, and specific connection to your investigator. If you need to spend, the size of your spend determines your contact's attitude, the value or excitement of their information, and or the, their position in their field. Of course, core clues will always be free. The keeper is encouraged to work your contact into the game on a regular basis whenever it makes any narrative sense, so they're kind of like recurring characters, which is pretty cool. So we have more examples of pools and how the, how the spend works. Then we got a table for credit rating. So basically anything above seven, you're aristocracy, basically. You have an annual income of 75000 plus, which is ridiculous at the time. You'll have amazing jewelry and private planes and yachts and stuff. Below that is upper class at six. So you'll be in a mansion or a penthouse with luxury cars. Uh, five is upper middle class and so on and so forth down to zero, which is the hobo life or living on handouts or scavenging on the streets. You're a pauper. So credit rating can be pretty important, but it's not the be all and end all. But it does certainly help you in certain situations. You know, if you need to get into exclusive environments, you know, deal with high rollers or important people. So Cthulhu Mythos, just like in Call of Cthulhu, it's not a base skill that you can buy. So they're only added during play, mostly by reading scary books. So if you read the Necronomicon, you may gain some points of Cthulhu Mythos, but then that permanently reduces your sanity as well. And when you use the ability, it'll use both sanity and stability. You can use that ability to, for example, work out what you know evidence of a particular Mythos god exists in a scene, for example, but... Doing that will have a cost in in sanity and stability because you will be digging into this horrible knowledge that you've accumulated through your experiences. Then we got stuff like flattery, evidence collection, geology, history, intimidation, which is often useful, as is interrogation, when you find witnesses who aren't really sure or are afraid to speak of what they saw, which is quite a frequent occurrence in these kind of investigative games. Library use. Always need somebody with that. A cult is always a good one. So this is where you can cast horoscopes, identify a cult, paraphernalia, grimoires, you know, understand things like demons and legends and, you know, ancient rituals and stuff like that. So it's another really useful one for a purist game and the Cthulhu tradition. You can have outdoorsmen. You can have pharmacy skills, physics skills, photography skills. Reassurance is really good. So that helps you to allay fear or panic in others and, and help kind of calm down a crisis, which can be really handy when things go south which they will at some point. <laughs> and then we get into the general abilities. So these work differently, basically. So they point out here, for example, if your athletics rating is eight or more, your hit threshold, the target number your opponents use when attempting to hit you in combat is four. Otherwise, your hit threshold is three. So, you know, the number that you have in these general abilities can affect what you can do with them. So, for example, if you've been taught to drive a car, you can basically do this stuff here. But for every two additional rating points, you can add an additional ground vehicle type to your repertoire. So you maybe have a motorcycle license or you can drive a lorry or a locomotive or something like that so you often get benefits for having higher point pools to spend in these abilities then we have hypnosis which again usually they only want you to use it in a pulp game so it's medical hypnosis you can only really do it to a willing subject so you can place your your patient in a trance establish an analytic rapport recover buried memories, or use post-hypnotic suggestions that, you know, use a trigger phrase or specific time and place to cause the patient to just do an action automatically without really thinking about it. You can also ease pain if you want to help your colleagues, but it, it needs to be done in a calm setting, you know, not in the middle of a fight. You can also implant false memories, but that's a contest against the patient's stability, so not always possible. Firearms, of course, is a good skill. It also covers things like crossbows, anything with a trigger, basically. And then for pulp games, you can spend extra points from your firearms pool to hit a target at long range. And if your firearms rating is five or higher, you can spend one point to fire two pistols in the same round. So you can double fist your pistols, which is pretty cool if you're playing pulp style. Filching is stealing small stuff, in case you didn't know what that was. First aid, if you use it on another character, you can potentially gain two points of health, three if you're a nurse or a doctor, or you can gain one point of your own health or two points if you're a nurse or a doctor. There's a little sidebar here about the terrifying long-range weapons used by some mythos races like the Chocho, Migo, and Lithians. So look out for those. Yeah, your health pool obviously is important. It's capped out at 12 for a purist game. But as you get beat up during a fight or you get ill or whatever, you can suffer 
analysis for that, so there's there's more on that. And they note again that the purest mode, it's capped at 12. Uh, mechanical repair, piloting, all that kind of stuff is pretty self-explanatory. Psychoanalysis is really useful. So the, you can basically restore panic investigator to a state of calm, restore lost stability points, and treat long-term mental illnesses that people get during the course of their activities. So that's really, really useful to keep a group, especially through a long-term campaign, from going completely mental. Um, sanity, of course, like in Call of Cthulhu, your sanity rating indicates the degree, degree to which you can sustain belief in any fundamental human concerns whatsoever. They're not, so, it's not something that you kind of test or spend points from your sanity pool. Basically, they're sucked away by contact with what they call the outside. I've been referring to, to the unnatural because of Delta Green, <laughs> but it's the same thing. And again, like with Call of Cthulhu or Delta Green, once your sanity reaches zero, basically you're you're broken beyond repair. You become an NPC, shut away in a, in a sanitarium forever. If you're unfortunate, you might end up being a servitor of some cult of the Great Old Ones or something even worse. They also note that if you have Cthulhu Mythos rating at all, as we said, your sanity rating can never be higher than 10 minus your Cthulhu Mythos rating. But you can buy your, your, your sanity rating above 10, but you will lose those points if you gain Cthulhu Mythos at some point. You can also, they also point out for a longer term, more survivable or pulpier game, the keeper may wish to adjust the ceiling upward or shift it downward for a shorter, deadlier, or starker game. And a character creation gets sanity for for free. And build from there. For each three full rating points your investigator possesses in sanity, you must define one pillar of sanity, which is a human concern that he believes in and trusts implicitly. They're abstract principles, not individual people. So it could be a uh, religious faith, your family, you know, the idea of human dignity and inherent value, the value of the intellect and scientific progress. The reality of scientific knowledge, this kind of stuff, the innate goodness of mankind. All of these things, of course, can be undermined by mythos revelations. And if they undermine your pillars in particular, then they will cost you additional sanity. Scuffling, as I mentioned, is basically hand to hand fighting. The use of blackjacks, brass knuckles, rolls of quarters, and so forth are also treated as scuffling. So you still use the same skill for a melee weapon. Sense trouble, as I mentioned, is to kind of your spider sense is tingling. You smell a suspicious smell. You know, you have an eerie feeling about something. You hear the splash of something dropping behind you. Basically, they do say, though, that the Keeper should never require the use of this ability to find clues, which should just be a way to build atmosphere and kind of, you know, racket up the horror in the scenario, but it shouldn't deny you access to clues. Shadowing is following suspects. Stability is kind of your ability during a, a session to maintain and, and keep your shit together, basically. So the sudden revelation or confirmation of the truths of the Cthulhu mythos can damage your stability. So can service in the Great War or the deaths of your family in a fire. So losing sanity can de decrease stability. The two are not di directly correlated. A sanity zero cultist of Hastur might be a gibbering backwoods cannibal with an appropriately low stability, or a sophisticated wealthy art critic with a stability higher than that of any of the investigators who seek to take him out. You get stability one for free, and in purest game, it's capped as 12, as we said before. So sources of stability, these will be for a pulp game. So you, these are individual people that you that keep you sane when... The terrors you've encountered threaten to shred you apart. A name and identifying phrase are sufficient for each, and they can't be your fellow investigators. Then finally, we have stealth, which is, of course, moving silently, hiding in shadows or, or taking cover. And if you're trying to sneakily lose a pursuer, instead, you would use shadowing. Outrunning a pursuer would be athletics or fleeing. And weapons means that you're skilled in the use of hand weapons, like knives, swords, or whips. Unlike the firearm skill, which is all about course long distance weapons and then we have an example character build this is the example character they've been building throughout martin harvison his drive is revenge for his dead partner he's a pi so he can spend points two for one after rolling disguise or shadowing his, his pillars of sanity are moral code loving chicago and the notion of human worth he's got zero build points left his th hit threshold is four so he must have built up his athletics he's got his occupational skills and then he's got some points that he's pumped into his general abilities so yeah, he's got eight, 8 in athletics, which gave him that higher hit threshold. He's got 10 in disguise, 10 in driving, 5 in firearms, which is not too bad, 6 in health, so that brings him up to 10, I think. 6 in mechanical repair, 10 in sanity, 8 in stability, 8 in sense trouble, 10 in shadowing, 8 in stealth, and 2 in weapons. So he's more about firing the gun than punching up close. He did add some points in locksmith and photography, for instance, it's in evidence collection and a few other interpersonal abilities and just one point in law and basically nothing in academics, which makes sense for the, the character concept. His sources of stability are Joan, his plucking, fast-talking secretary, Lieutenant McAllen, his former partner. So there's lots of side notes here about, you know, only alien Asperger psychologists can buy hypnosis and only in a pulp game. So, you know, there's a note there for that, just to remind you. 
So finally, the mechanics. So Gumshoe Engine separates the process of finding clues from dealing with or running away from monsters and stuff like that. So the idea is that if you're in an investigative moment in a scene where relevant information can be gathered and you have the right ability and you tell the keeper that you're using it, you will get the clue. You will never fail to get the clue, and there's no die roll involved. So you can specify exactly what you want to achieve. So the example here, I use art history to see if the idol is authentically late Minoan, and they will tell you yes or no. Or you can look for wider speculation. You can engage in informational fishing expeditions. So you can say, I use my evidence collection to look for clues in the alleyway. Or I use chemistry to just test what's in the meteorite. You're not looking for a specific chemical. You just need to know what's in there. Now, the keeper might ask you as well if you have an appropriate ability for the situation to try and prompt you to, you know, get thinking about what skills you might be able to use to gain clues in the scenario. So when players search a specific area in a house, say, like, I look in, a, in the desk, in the tub, whatever, they don't need to use an ability for that. Basically, like, you know, you're a trained investigator. You're expected to have enough ability to find stuff on a basic level that you can just gain the clues without using the sp any specific ability. With evidence collection, clues become available to a player simply by being on the scene and indicating that you're looking for them. So you don't have to say specifically where you're going to look. You can just say, I will use evidence collection, and you'll get those clues. And then there's some example benefits. So if you do decide to spend your points that you have in, in your investigative abilities, which may not be a lot of points, uh, especially if you have a larger group, they give you loads of example benefits that you could get. So, you know, you might see, find that your petrol tank has been punctured just before you drive the vehicle. You know, you get a benefit in a future contest of general abilities. You get a favorable impression to supporting characters. You could have a flashback scene. You could resolve a moral dilemma. If your character finds the action required to get a or clue distasteful, you might make a point spend to avoid this. It might speed up the use of the ability, and thus speed up the investigation. It might get you some dedicated pool points. So for example, a library you spend might allow you to find a book which gives you a history of New England dedicated point pool. A technical spend might allow you to create a notable work or an academic spend to write an influential paper. And an art spend would allow you to create a painting. Impressive point spend may even lead to refreshment of stability, which will help you survive the rest of the session. So then there's some more details here for especially helpful for keepers about, you know, dealing with investigative point spends and getting benefits. And they give examples of the dedicated pool points idea. Sometimes it can be important to work out you know, who finds the clue in a scenario. So generally that'd be the person with the relevant ability, but you might have more than one person with that ability. So then who finds it? So if one or more players have a relevant ability, you should choose the one with the highest current pool. If no one has a relevant ability or no one ability seems to apply this to the situation, ask yourself which player seems most in need of a win. I think that's a nice approach. Inconspicuous clues. Sometimes the investigators instinctively notice something without actively looking for it. It's unreasonable to expect players to ask to use their various abilities in what appears to be an innocuous transitional scene. Instead, the keeper would ask which character has the highest current pool in the ability in question. If the two or more pools are equal, it goes to the one with the highest rating. If the ratings are also equal, their characters find the clue at the same time. So that's pretty cool as well. If you're in a scene where it's not immediately obvious that you should be looking for a clue, the keeper will just flag that up and say, hey, who's got the most points in X? And whoever does will, will get the clue from that little side mission or side scene. And then we have tests. So this is where we are actually rolling dice for the first time. So as they note here, all die rolls use a single ordinary six-sided die. That's it. Just 1d6. So you don't need any fancy dice or narrative dice or anything, which, you know, is, is great, but also I kind of like fancy dice. <laughs> I have to admit, I really like FFG Star Wars. I really like the L5R games, as, you, as you've seen in my previous videos. But having a game where all you need is like this book, a d6, is pretty, pretty great. So for a simple test, basically, the investigator is trying to do a difficult action without active resistance. So, you know, you're driving on a dangerous road, you're trying to sneak to a building, you know, setting a booby trap or whatever. And you'll be set a difficulty number from 2 to 8, where 2 is pretty easy and 8 is almost impossible. Then you roll a die, and if the result is greater than the difficulty, you succeed. But before rolling the die, you can spend any number of points from the relevant ability pool. So expenditure of pool points in this way represents special effort and concentration by the investigator, the kind you, you can muster only so many times during the course of an adventure. In the purest mode, losing points is meant to hurt, and investigators are frequently distracted, their senses are unreliable. So the keeper doesn't reveal difficulty numbers. In pulp mode, Investigators are hardened adventurers, and keepers may choose to reveal difficulty in this mode. So that, I think that's pretty cool as well. So you can set a difficulty, and the players don't know what it is in the purest mode. They just have to decide, well, how tough do I think this is for my character? Do I need to spend points to make sure I beat the threshold? You know, if, if I have two points spare left in my firearms thing, and I'm trying to, to snipe a ghoul in the back of the head, I don't know how difficult it is due to the range. You know, it's a little bit dark. Maybe I should spend those two points. You know, you have to use your judgment and, and strategize because those points don't come back super quick.
And then we have using the same mechanics in the context of contests. So that's when you have more than one participant are trying to do the same thing or are fighting against each other. The most common contest in this is the chase. So investigators are running away from slavering entities intent on ripping them limb for limb. So each participant acts in turn. The first to fail a role of the contested ability loses. And then the keeper decides who acts first. In chase, the character who bolts from the scene acts first. The first contestant to act makes a test of the ability in question. If he fails, he loses the contest. If he succeeds, the second then makes a test. Typically, each contestant is trying to be a difficulty number of four. So these are some examples of stuff like that. Then we get to fighting, which are a bit more complicated because you're going up against something which has their own abilities in the same category. So we're dealing with scuffling versus scuffling, scuffling versus weapons, or weapons versus weapons. So this is when fights are in close quarters, basically. If it's firing guns at each other, then you're using firearms versus firearms. So here they talk about fighting with no abilities. You can do that, but you automatically go last in the round. You do minus two damage. You know, if you roll a one on a firearms roll, it means you've accidentally shot yourself or one of your allies. <laughs> as chosen randomly by the keeper. So that's not great. So then they mentioned the hit threshold thing. So each investigator has a hit threshold of either three or four if your athletics are more than eight. So that's the difficulty number that the investigator's opponent must match or beat in order to harm him. Less competent NPCs may have lower thresholds, but cult guards, Gestapo agents, and similar opponents will generally parallel investigator levels. Creatures can have hit thresholds of four or higher, including even extremely large thresholds for certain creatures. So when you deal damage, basically when you roll equal to or over your opponent's thre hit threshold, you may deal damage to him. So you make a damage roll rolling a die, which is then modified according to the relative lethality of your weapon. So that's using this table here. A fist or a kick is not very lethal, so you get a minus two. An improvised weapon like a blackjack or a knife or a whatever is a minus one. A big improvised weapon like a heavy club or a fireplace poker would be a zero. A sword or a heavy firearm would give you a plus one. Supernatural creatures, however, often have alarmingly high damage modifiers, but for firearms you can get at least an additional plus two when fired at point blank range, and all shotguns are considered heavy firearms at short, at short range, so they get a plus one. And there's more details about firearms in a subsequent table. So combat can become chaotic when two groups of combatants are fighting. So the keeper will determine an order of action, ranking all the participants according to their present pool values and the fighting skills they're starting with. Ties are broken in favor of characters with higher ratings in those skills. So that's an interesting thing about the system. You might have, you know, eight points in scuffling and if you've spent five points in the fight, but your rating is still considered eight. So that would still put you higher in the dex order of, of combat, basically. So having the higher number still counts, even though you don't have as so many points to actually spend, which I think is interesting. Here we go. So they, they talk about how to do more realistic damage with firearms as well, if that bothers you. In this game, firearms are not as deadly as they are in Call of Cthulhu. You can usually survive like two or three shots before you go down. In Cthulhu, you can take a shot in the face and just die straight away because a character might have 10 hit points and a, a Colt 45 or, or a similar will do 1d10 plus 2 damage. So very possibly you'll die in one hit. Here is a little bit more forgiving than that. So if you if your health pool goes down to zero to minus five, you're hurt, but it's not permanent. You could be first aided by somebody and get your kind of condition back. But if your pool is between minus six and minus eleven, you've been seriously wounded and you have to make a consciousness roll. Whether you're conscious or not, you can't fight anymore, and you will lose an additional health point every half hour until somebody first aids you. So you really need a, a doctor or something to stabilize you. But they can't restore your health points. So you, if you've been seriously wounded, you have to go to a hospital or something for a period of several days at least. Your period of forced inactivity is a number of days equal to the positive value of your lowest health pool score. So if you're reduced to minus eight health, you're hospitalized for eight days. On your day of your discharge, your health pool increases to half its maximum value, and on the next day, it refreshes fully. If your pool dips to minus 12 or below, you're dead. Time to activate your replacement investigator. In a purist game, the investigators are no different from anyone else. All humans lose health mechanically in the same way. In the pulp mode, investigators are cut above, so normal people die when their health is reduced to zero, so they die quicker. They also tend to have lower hit thresholds for mooks. There's not really a lot of body armor available in the 30s besides, like, Great War Surplus stuff, so you can reduce cutting damage and damage from bullets by two points if you have a tin hat, or from clubs or brunt trauma by one point, but that's only effective against headshots. You might have, you know, tough leather jackets or heavy outer garments that might help you against brawling attacks or improvised weapons. You you can also intentionally do non-lethal damage to try and force somebody to be unconscious. So you'll never get their health boot below minus 11, so they won't die. 
but you'll just, you know, you can keep forcing them to make a consciousness roll to stay awake. Uh, and that could be useful if you want to question somebody and they're not that keen to do so. All right, you got us. Monsters in Chicago Chicago and New York of the 30s did, in fact, wear heavy bulletproof vests made of thick layers of cotton padding and cannabis or denim. All that said, it's not entirely ridiculous for such things to show up, especially in a pulp idiom game set in Gangland, Chicago. However, it's pretty obvious if you're wearing such a thing. It's not like today where you could hide a, a you know a stabbed vest under pretty normal clothing without most people noticing. Also, in a gunfight, cover will help you. So if there's no barrier at all, then your hit threshold decreases by one. Partial cover means that some of your body, about half of it, is exposed. And your hit threshold remains the same. If you're under full cover, your whole body is fully covered by that obstruction. Your hit threshold increases by one. A rate of fire is an interesting one because you do have submachine guns and stuff and room clearing weapons. And if you fire them on full auto, you get two extra points in your firearms pool if you have one. If you can get something like crazy like a Tommy gun with a huge drum of ammo, you have three points in your firearms pool instead of two. So then you have to stop for one round to reload after that. So it kind of represents like you're just spraying bullets all over the place. If you roll a one on a submachine gun on full auto, even if you hit, your gun jams and you must stop combat until you succeed at a mechanical repair roll. In purest mode, firearms are discouraged. The keeper either keep track of ammunition used to maintain tension or rule that any firearm roll of one means the gun is empty and must be reloaded a roll of one therefore is an automatic miss after all reticent antiquarians rarely practice proper aim control or shooting discipline in the pulp mode you know you don't worry about that so much you just shoot bullets and stuff and and have fun so the point of combat in this game as you can see it's very simple it's very straightforward you're just testing the, the appropriate fighting skill against a hit threshold your opponent's doing the same you go in order of number of points in the relevant fight skill that you're using and that's it basically. There's some more stuff like you have explosive devices and they can do different amounts of damage, different ranges, and their ranges vary quite a bit. You know, if you have a propane tank, gas main, you know, artillery shell, etc. Explosions and explosives, other dangers like acid falling, fire. Um, then we get into losing stability. So when you encounter something that challenges your grip on yourself, you'll may be asked to make a stability test against a difficulty number of four, and you can spend stability points to provide a bonus, but it's never a good bet to spend more points than you stand to lose if you fail. So you can also spend yourself negative, which can be helpful if you need to cast a last ditch spell or something, but it's often not a good idea. So they give you some examples of stability and how it works and explain why they have both sanity and stability. And they use pretty convincing argument from Lovecraftian literature about why to have two stats, having like a short term sanity and a long term one. And they have a nice table summarizing stability loss. So seeing a fresh corpse would be one all the way up to, you know, seeing a loved one or source of stability killed in a gruesome way, or you kill them, you would lose eight points. If you speak with someone you know very well to be dead, you would lose seven points. You know, you discover you've committed cannibalism, lose six points. It's pretty messed up stuff. <laughs> so role-playing instability, this is really good for players. Basically, you know, if you lost one to two points, you might sort of twitching a bit or you get a little bit sort of anxious. Three to four points, you're hyperventilating. You might be sweating. You might be babbling to yourself. At five to six points, you may go into weird little fugue states. So you sort of miss things happening around you. Or you might be hyper-aware on the other end. And if you hit, lost seven or eight points, you've gone into shock of some kind. So... There you go. So stability is kind of your short-term sanity, and then losing sanity itself is affected by directly experiencing the Cthulhu mythos and piercing together its truths. You cannot make a test to avoid losing sanity. A mythos shock drops your stability pool to zero below, makes you lose your sanity, or if you use the Cthulhu mythos ability. Beholding one of the gods or titans of the mythos and a few other specific magical or mythos stimuli can cost you sanity, but that's rare, and that's covered in the relevant entries in the Cthulhu mythos chapter. Each time you are blasted by a mythos encounter or attack, when your stability drops to between minus 6 and minus 11, your sanity rating drops by 2 points. You can only suffer one such sanity rating loss in a given investigation. So here's how they talk about those conditions. So stability 0 to minus 5, you're shaken. Minus 6 to 11, you're blasted. Minus 12 or less, you're incurably insane. So you create a new investigator. Then we have some info about avoiding sanity loss. What happens when you use Cthulhu Mythos abilities? So any sanity loss from Cthulhu Mythos cannot be denied away. The knowledge comes from within and the investigator knows it to be accurate. So there's a chart on page 76. So there's an optional rule here about big reveal and how that can affect your sanity and so forth. And then a little table for Cthulhu Mythos stability and sanity lost. So if the Mythos truth shatters one of your pillars of sanity, you'd lose six stability and two sanity. If it could destroy the world or is doing so right now, then you'd lose eight stability and three sanity. So, you know, it gives you an idea of how to, to play along these two scales. So if you're being blasted by instability, which was outlined here, so between minus six and minus 11, 
you can get a, a sort of mental illness aspect. So it could be shell shock, mythos madness. It could also be things like delusion, homicidal mania, uh, megalomania, multiple personality disorder. You become obsessed with something, possibly relating to the investigation. You might become paranoid. Everybody's after you. You might develop a phobia. You might have selective amnesia, just forgetting something that everybody else clearly remembers. You can refresh stability using psychological triage, and there's confidence, which can be used in a pulp game as well. So recovering spent pool points depends on what kind of points you're you're spending. So investigative spool ability pools are refreshed only at the end of the case. Most scenarios are like two to three sessions long for an individual investigation. So you'll refresh at the end of that, not at the end of a session. But you may have story breakpoints in a long campaign where you get a investigative pool refresh. Your general ability pools, they refresh whenever you create a temporary haven where you're free from danger or horror manifestations for an hour or more. And you can refresh up to three general abilities except for health, sanity, and stability. If your place of safety is penetrated, then you lose whatever you regain during that time. You get only one opportunity for this accelerated refreshment per session. So health pool refreshes over time at a rate of two points per day of restful activity. Unless you're wounded, then you have a different result. You can also refresh stability between games. In a purist game, there's no unlearning or comfort you can do to recover sanity. It never returns. So in a pulp game, you know, you might get a reward of some sanity points back if you defeat a major threat. Mental illness as well can be treated by prolonged treatment using the psychoanalysis ability. So another good reason to have one possibly in your team. And then finally, improving your investigator. So at the end of each session, you get two build points for each session you participated in. They can be used to increase either investigative or general abilities at a one-to-one basis. You can get new abilities or bolster existing ones. Uh, for a purist Lovecraftian, though, nothing you can do can improve your investigator. He's lucky to still be able to hold his own after a shattering experiences. The keeper may allow you to reassign points, however. So two different ways of approaching that aspect. So then we get into the Cthulhu mythos, which I won't spend too much time on because we talked about that with Cthulhu. They do mention the Dreamlands. There's a whole separate book on that, the uh, Dreamhounds of Paris, which is very, very good. So we have the mechanics of the gods. Basically, given these beings vast psychic powers, seeing them in dreams is no safer than seeing them in liquescent protein flesh, but dreams or visions can at least be denied. The following table give the additional stability and sanity pool point losses over and above those indicated on the stability loss table risked by such encounters. So if you run into a big mythos god, people are probably going to lose it. So the keeper should be more than willing to alter these numbers to suit herself or just mess with player expectations. So basically... They go into as well why, you know, they they included only two stats for gods and titans, the additional stability loss and sanity loss suffered when they're encountered, which is here. The most powerful entities are difficult to define, and the book takes a similar approach. So they allow the keeper a lot of sort of interpretation room. Um, and mythos entities that appear in a purist setting are given, of course, the, the symbol here. So at Azathoth there, a number of different possibilities for what Azathoth could actually be, which is really great. Then we have other well-known great old ones. We've got, of course, Cthulhu, one of the most well-known of all of Lovecraft's creations. And again, a million different bits of possible factoids that you could use. But again, no stats. It's not like BRP. You're not going to be smashing him apart with a boat. You know, he's just going to show up and screw things up majorly and drive you insane. Uh, we've got Daloth. We've got uh, Gatanathoa. You know, Ithaqua, Hastur. All the favorites are here. Nyarlathotep and his many forms. Nodens, Shubnigarath and her thousand young. Sothogwa. Yig, the god of the serpent people. Yoxothoth, the opener of the way, which is always this kind of bubbly thing. So yeah, I mean, I really like the way that they've approached this. The gods are, are just, you know, they don't want to give them stats beyond how they break your mind. And I think that's a fair approach. But I do kind of like having stats for them in BRP because, you know, in Call of Cthulhu, they do hit him with a boat to get away. It doesn't kill Cthulhu. But he disappears into mist and they're able to escape. So being able to do that, I think, is cool mechanically. But I guess, you know, in Trail of Cthulhu, you could do that sort of narratively. But I don't think it has the same punch as when you, you know, roll the dice against the impossible odds and go, yeah, we got them just for now. And you can get the hell out of Dodge, you know. And we've got tomes and magic. So, of course, we have some of the more famous mythos tomes found in here. So reading mythos tomes by skimming, you know, depending on your library, you spend 
will recover you know useful facts, but doesn't give you Cthulhu Mythos points and doesn't necessarily count as using the, using the Cthulhu Mythos ability. If you research the tome, you're pouring over it. That'll take place between adventures. It can take a really long time, depending on what the Keeper thinks. And you might gain some spells, secrets, or Cthulhu Mythos points. Repeated pourings don't add further points, however. And if you have tomes that are in a foreign language, you need to know the language, of course, in order to translate it. And these tomes are often written by madmen, right? And and so that they needed to be they need to be properly studied to understand them. And they give you some cool lore about each of the well known mythos tomes that we see in Lovecraft. You know, the King in Yellow, giving you plus two to your Cthulhu mythos rating, plus one to your art ability rating permanently. Seeing the sign is a three point stability test, the yellow sign of Hastur. We've got the Narcotic Manuscripts, the Revelations of Glocky, all kinds of cool stuff in here. The Thirteenth Sonata by Alexander Scriabin, the Mad Composer. And then we got some spells as well. We'll get to that in more detail in the small supplement called Rough Magics, which I think is sort of systematizes spellcasting in the, in the game in a much more effective way. So uh, we'll look at that in the next video, which will cover key basic supplements for the game. But casting spells on a basic level, you'd usually do a test of stability and some kind of ritual, and you'll typically be having a contest against whatever you summoned or against the fabric of space-time itself. So like Create Hyperspace Gate requires two stability or four health, but uh, you can also swap one ability for the other at twice the cost. And if you have multiple sorcerers who know the spell, you can share the costs. So they have some sample spells here, and casting a spell definitely counts as a mythos shock if the constant stability loss is grave enough to potentially cost the spellcaster sanity. Sanity zero wizards can never need to make a test to cast an incantation, it just happens. So mad cultist wizards are very dangerous for that reason. <laughs> Then we have some example spells and contacting deity spells as a general category. The god will begin the contact in a semi-friendly manner, but will not aid non-worshippers without an exceptionally good reason. They're quick to anger, or the caster who wastes the being time, oversteps her bounds, or seems weak and foolish, is likely to get squished, driven mad, possessed, or otherwise toyed with for a brief period. So you can contact Cthulhu. Not necessarily a great idea. Contact the Deep Ones, the Miko, or a ghoul. So these are all pretty standard spells that we would expect from Call of Cthulhu as well. Contacting Starspawn, creating a gate between dimensions, between areas. The Dona formula, so you can behold the inner city at the two magnetic poles of the Earth and see other arcane locations, planets, realms, abysses, and dimensions of being. And it can be found in some editions of the Necronomicon, possibly including the creation of a temporary hyperspace gate to the location you're viewing. You can repeat the dread name of Azathoth to help you gain control over some lesser servitor species. You got the Elder Sign, which can protect you against mythos things. Yeah, the Powder of Ibn Ghazi, which makes invisible things visible. A Shriveling Spell, which works on targets regardless of armor, which is handy. Summoning and Binding Spells. This is when you want to summon something scary and use it, but you also need to bind it. Basically forcing the thing to not eviscerate you, and instead follow one specific instruction. Like, kill that guy, or never come back to Earth again, or stand by me, protect me from harm forever. But yeah, some of these spells are more recommended for cult games and purist games. Most of the summon and bind spells are perfectly sensible for purist game because we've seen those for many years in Call of Cthulhu adventures and so forth. Then we've got rituals. So these will be, yeah, the, you're the stability, stability test rating, the opposition, the total cost to so the caster or casters, and the time. So these are not spells that you can cast in a combat or something like that. Some of these you can cast in combat in the previous section, of course, but they may have a multiple round casting time, depending on the spell. Rituals are generally taking a lot more time. So, like, then there's weird combos as well. So, for example, Curse of the Stone takes two rounds to cast, but one month to engrave and enchant the titular stone. Then we get creatures. So, creature stats are basically pretty simple. So, they have ability pools, depending on their environment or means of locomotion, one higher than the other. Um... The hit threshold, weapon damage, and armor of creatures were the same way that they do for investigators. Uh, and the alertness modifier for a given creature re reflects its keener or paranormal senses, or in some cases is brutish dullness or weak perceptions in earthly reality. Then they have a stability loss and a stealth modifier if they are harder to see for humans. And they give you some basic stats for key creatures like Biaki, the Colorado Space, along with some great details for description and their special abilities like will drain for the color out of space but you can see the game stats are really simple they just have athletics 4 uh, out of 20 health 4 out of 20 scuffling 628 and then you know how you could find these creatures signs through different investigative skills that's probably the most important thing so if you were looking for what caused a uh, particularly weird death using the right skills under these circumstances could tell you oh well that might be this, uh, you know, we had reports of this strange color sort of vibrating in the sky and 
making the local vegetation grow, and then you know it's a Colorado space. And they do that for all the monsters, which is really great. Helps you to work them into an investigation. You can even, you know, make something up on the fly with just picking a particularly scary monster, you know, having it leave a trail of nastiness around and see if your characters can find them and, and deal with them. And there's a great race of Yeth, a nice illustration, by the way. And a Hound of Tindalos, uh, of course, they have their special ability to manifest through the angles of time and space. The classic hunting horrors, the Kanyani, again, you know, entities we've seen in other Cthuloid games. And we have rat things, the night gaunts here with no faces, the serpent folk, uh, servitors of the outer god, those are the flautists around Azathoth. And here we see an interesting interpretation of them, a bit tick-like or cockroach-like. And we have the Shan, sort of the kind of insects from Shagai, I think. And they have a number of special abilities, including the infestation of your brain and the nerve whip. It's quite similar to their BRP incarnation. And then we got Shoggoths, of course, a classic. A son of yogg Sothoth, Space Eaters, Zothian Star Vampires, Chochos. And then uh, some regular beasts and monsters. So dinosaurs, you know, could be trapped outside of time. Bears, crocodiles, lake monsters, gorillas, mummies, lions, snakes, vampires, wolves, yetis, and zombies. There you go. And then some cults and cultists. This is really helpful for the for the keeper as well. Just laying out some specific occult organizations that you could work into a game, like the Brotherhood of the Yellow Sign, on Nerbe, Society for Research into the Spiritual Roots of German Ancestral Heritage, was in 1928 dedicated to folk occult research. We have the Cult of Cthulhu, of course, Cult of the Skull, the Starry Wisdom Sect, so that's about you know, Lathotep. And then we have the Witch Cult, and there were a few different varieties of these. Then we have networks of Yithian agents, so they provide their agents with advanced technological items and machinery, and the occasional snippet of unearthly knowledge. So there you go. And you can also create cults, of course, and there's some hot tips on that here. Then we have some background info on the 30s. Here they call it Dirty 30s. So, you know, we have the Dust Bowl, we have the desperate times and poverty of the Depression. There was famine and war across the world, and we were just out of World War One in the 20s, and we're already building up to World War Two, which was even worse people thought it was impossible at the time. And then, yeah, so quite a few people at the time believed that the future was going to be written by Hitler or Stalin, and they chose up sides accordingly. Lovecraft began as a fan of Hitler and converted to late in life to supporting a sort of dirigist collectivist technocracy. Lovecraft was a bit of a troubled guy. Not the best opinions about stuff in general, but he was very creative when it came to horror. Now we have the nightmare countries, so... These are various locations where, you know, the mythos tourist might show up. So Abyssinia, Antarctica, the Belgian Congo, Brazil, Burma, Easter Island, Egypt, of course Germany, where there was a lot of research happening with the Nazis, all this kind of stuff. Greenland, which is identified with the mystical homeland of Thule, Louisiana, Haiti, Mongolia, Peru, Saudi Arabia. Of course, there's some interesting stuff happening in the Soviet Union at that time. Tibet, of course. Which has a great supplement for Call of Cthulhu, by the way. Uh, and then we have a little bit about the tech of the 30s. So there's a motor vehicle table here with some typical vehicles at the time. Their cost in money at that period of time. And their top speed, which is way faster than the typical vehicles in Call of Cthulhu in a lot of cases. And uh, some of them have special abilities. You know, the Rolls-Royce limo can seat eight, for example. The Stutz Bearcat Roadster two-seater. It's a plus one to roll in all road driving tests because it's more maneuverable. And then we have aircraft available as well, which for the pilot would be quite useful. So you typically would have a small airplane, like a biplane or, you know, a seaplane, a relatively small number of people on board. And we got a firearms table. So light firearms give a plus zero to damage. Heavy arms get plus one. Very heavy firearms can go even further. Uh, they do plus two damage, but you have to be in a prone position or in the case of the elephant rifle, you have to make an athletics t athletics test to stay on your feet after firing it. And there's loads of examples here and, and costs as well. Yeah, and then we have summaries of adventuring gear. And then we get into tips for keepers. Again, I think there's useful stuff in here, but I think some of it is a little bit outdated. Particularly when you're talking about use of clues and giving out of clues. So you should download the Enchiridion of Elucidation for some direction with that. As far as campaign frames as well, there's some nice examples in here, which I won't spoil for the sake of any players who might be watching this. You know, if you're interested in the idea of the game with a real laser focus on, you know, investigation and, and things related to that and uh, 
quick and chaos-filled combat system, then ask your GM to pick up the core book and see where you go. But remember, there is a Kickstarter coming up next month for a second edition, so do look out for that. But Pelgrane Press is a very small company that puts out great, great products, and they do indeed deserve your money. Here we have a wonderful set of conversion tables. So if you want to use a gumshoe-style play in BRP, it's really easy. Just you can basically allow people to get clues for free, you know, given certain ability levels. And then converting BRP to gumshoe, there's some great details on that, including converting damage rolls to Trail of Cthulhu damage levels. Uh, then we get into uh, key sources and then a blank character sheet. Uh, which we can, of course, get free PDFs copies of online. Investigative Matrix, so useful for the Keeper to keep track of what's been spent, you know, how many sources of stability and pillars and contacts and whatever somebody's got. Then the Investigative Ability Checklist. So when creating the adventure, you know, make sure you have core clues that, you know, span the gamut of investigative skills, notes on your campaign frame that you'll give to your players so that they know what kind of adventure they're going into, what the, the scenery will be like, what the style will be like, how pervasive the mythos will be, etc. And then we have some handy reference tables. And that, in a nutshell, is Trail of Cthulhu. I hope you enjoyed that. It's a great game, basically. I think it's uh, you know well worth the cash, even if you are a player of BRP and a dedicated player of Call of Cthulhu like I am. I really enjoy what they've done with this game. It really creates a different vibe, so it's it's some players will prefer it. Also, the adventures and the in particular the campaign, it's 400 pages long called Eternal Lies, have had fantastic reviews. I've really enjoyed all the source books I have for it, and I'll show you some more of those in the coming days. We'll start first with a short video on uh, really basic central stuff like Rough Magics, the GM screen, a resource book. And then we'll look at The Hideous Creatures, which I think is a wonderful book for anybody who wants to use Mythos Monsters, not just the Trail of Cthulhu Keeper. So, with that being said, I uh, hope that helps you decide. If you really want to know what, what I think is a better game, I would still say Call of Cthulhu for me. But that's really because I enjoy the extra choices that you can make in combat, stuff like that. However... Uh, with the second edition, if they bring in the stuff from Knight's Black Agents, which I'll also be showcasing this month, that may well change because uh, those games have quite interesting combat abilities you can use. So you never know. Basically, I just want my players to have fun. So whatever they prefer is what I'm going to run. And as long as it gets the vibe and the mood and gives me the tools to do so, which both games definitely do, then I'm happy. So give it a look. You know, give Pelgrane Press your money and uh, let me know what you think of the game. And in the meantime, I'll come back to you with future videos, like I said, on the other supplements. And until then, take care and hope to see you in the comment section below and in the next video. And uh, be sure and leave a like and hopefully subscribe on your way out. All right, take care. Cheers. Bye-bye.